Uh, I'm going to read the passage from chapter 1, verse 6, through to the end of chapter 1. Uh, the bits in chapter 2 will pick up along the way throughout the sermon. So let's read that together first. A son honours his father and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honour? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar. How have we defiled you, you ask? When you say, the Lord's table is contemptible. When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favour? Asked the Lord of armies. And now plead for God's favour. Will he be gracious to us? Since this has come from your hands, will he show any of you favour? Asked the Lord of armies. I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of armies, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. But you are profaning it when you say, the Lord's table is defiled and its product, its food, is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it, says the Lord of armies. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept that from your hands, asked the Lord? The deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever gone into something, an activity or a situation, half-hearted? You might have heard of some of these sayings before, uh, near enough is good enough, or something is better than nothing. I know that for uni students, or at least some of them, this attitude gets verbalised in the phrase, P's get degrees, meaning if you can at least pass, you'll get a degree. Near enough is good enough. Do you ever think like that about situations in your life? Doing things half-hearted with the attitude of near enough is good enough? What about when it comes to God? Do you ever feel like that? That near enough is good enough for God? In today's passage from Malachi, we'll see that this is a, is a symptom of a major problem for God's people, in particular the priests. So before we dive into the passage, um, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your written word. Thank you that you speak to us through it, that we can know you, your name and character from it. Please be with me as I speak now from your word. Please be with us all to hear what it has to say as we seek to wholeheartedly honour you in our gathering around your word. Amen. So at point two on the outline, uh, last week we learned uh, that in Malachi there's sort of a three-part pattern. Uh, God makes a declaration, the people respond, and then God responds or explains further. So today's declaration comes in verse 6. A son honours his father and a servant his master. But if I'm a father, where is my honour? And if I'm a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests, who despise my name. So here's the problem. Rather than honouring God like a son would honour his father or a servant his master, the priests are despising God's name. So last week, instead of um, the people singing, 
Where is the love? Now, God's singing. Where is the love? Okay? It's, it's God's turn. He's pointing out now, you don't love me. If we think along the lines of the covenant, God has and is fulfilling his part of the bargain. The people are not, to the point that they're showing dishonour to him, to the point of despising him and his name. Now, we heard last week that the people think that God doesn't love them. So if he doesn't love them, if they can't see or understand the evidence of his love, then why give him what he deserves? Do we ever think like that? I want to bring two things out here before I move on. The first one, note who the accusation is against here. It's the priests. Now, the priests, they had two jobs, two parts of their job, sacrifices and teaching, and they were not wholehearted in either of these. But then I guess, I mean, if you think God doesn't love you, then why would you be wholehearted? It's important to remember as God speaks through this passage, he is directing a lot of his talk at the priests and that the accusation is around what they should have been doing, around their lack of wholeheartedness. However, we'll see that that then has a massive flow-on effect. The sin of the priests has a big flow-on effect to the people. The second thing to note here is what God says they despise. It's his name. Now, Bernard's already touched on this in the kids' talk, but in the, in the Bible, the name of God means the revealed character of God. And so to despise his name is to despise the very nature of who God is. This is God who had, who had rescued his people from Egypt, who at Mount Sinai had made a covenant with them, making a commitment to them and they back to him, who had looked after them in the wilderness, who brought them back out of exile after they had been disobedient over and over. This is a God who is loving, powerful, gracious, merciful, just, so to despise his name is to despise every aspect and attribute of who he is. So the problem is God is not being honoured rightly. He's not being feared or worshipped. He's not being loved. He's being despised. And so he then lays out the evidence for how the people, the priests in particular, are despising him. So this is point three on the outline. So we see in verse 7, by presenting defiled food on my altar. And again in verse 7, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible. So in other words, the animals that are being brought for the sacrifice were dodgy, rather than bringing the best for God. They were bringing lame animals, injured, sick, blind they are bringing these for the priests used for the sacrifices and in doing so they devalue the covenant made and the importance and the purpose of the sacrifice. So I'm going to tangent here for a moment to get a bit of a history on this and why this is so bad. So the first five books of the Old Testament, these books set up the beginning, yeah? Uh, so God creates the world, God creates people, God chooses and saves his people, God shows his people how to live as his people. Essentially, there's the establishment of his covenant. Now, the sacrifice system was a big part of this covenant. You've got to remember that God is a holy God and his people are sinful. And as such, they deserve judgment. And so the sacrifices were offered to atone of their sins for redemption and for forgiveness, as well as for thanksgiving. The animal slaughtered as part of the sacrifice would be a substitution, taking the place of the people to die in their place. This system was designed to maintain the relationship which the covenant had brought into being between a holy and righteous God and his sinful people and would therefore reflect the mind and the attitude of the people as worshippers towards God. So the priests at the tabernacle would be the ones to sort of perform a lot of the sacrifice 
um, ritual. They were the mediators between God and his people. If you want to know more about all that stuff, read Leviticus. It's all in Leviticus. Um, but some specific rules and guidelines here. In Leviticus 22.20, it says, you are not to present anything that has a defect because it will not be accepted on your behalf. And then in Deuteronomy 17.1, about sacrifice as well, do not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or sheep with a defect or any serious flaw, for that is detestable to the Lord your God. So the people, in particular the priests, knew it was wrong to sacrifice blemished animals. I mean, it's laid out for them there, isn't it? And I mean, in, in the passage, the repetition of is it not wrong sort of implies, look, this is just common sense. You know, like, come on, guys. You know it's wrong to offer shoddy sacrifices. Take seriously this system that God, out of his grace, established for us. It makes sense that to offer something dodgy or faulty is not really a sacrifice. Giving the best, now that's a sacrifice, yeah? That reflects a true wholehearted act of worship. The priests knew all this, and yet they were allowing the people to bring the dodgy animals. This gets brought out more when what they were giving to the local governor gets compared with what they're giving to God. Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favour? You know, the people respected the governor and his power, so they brought him great offerings. They wouldn't dare bring him something dodgy. I think probably because they knew what would happen to him if they did bring something dodgy. So then why give the inferior stuff to God? Isn't God worthy of better things, better offerings than the governor? Do we ever do that? Not give God the best things, but give him the sloppy seconds. Now, God goes on to rebuke the priests even more. In verse 11, which is our memory verse. So if you've got your bulletins, we're going to read this bit together. We're going to practice doing the memory verse sometimes. So kids, you can join with us now. We're going to read the memory verse together. I know we only did a little bit before. We'll do the whole thing now, sorry. Here we go. My name will be great among the nations from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now, this verse is actually one of the the most controversial in this book in Malachi. Uh, There's lots of interpretations around what it's meaning, but what I think it's talking about here is a future time when all of the nations will worship God. There's a contrast here. On the one hand, you have the priests who have been, uh, and the people who have been dishonouring God with their sloppy seconds, who in verse 13 even think it's a nuisance to do it in the first place. And then on the other, you have the honour and acceptable offerings that will come to God one day from those among the nations, those who are truly redeemed, those who acknowledge God for who he truly is, who don't despise his name, but joyfully worship his name. So the evidence against the people, and the priests in particular, is growing. Ha, but wait, there is more. Have a look at verse 14. The deceiver is cursed, who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow, but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. Now, this is pretty bad. This is essentially someone going, hey, God, I'm in trouble. Can you help me get out of this mess? Uh, I'll, I'll sacrifice my best male for you. And then God follows through. And then when it's time for the sacrifice, the person goes, you know what? I might even just keep that one. Uh, but, you know, I'll give you this one instead. But, uh, you know, it's got a broken leg and, you know, it coughs a lot. And, you know, it's not even mine. I'm stealing it from him. Um, But that should be good enough, shouldn't it? That should be good enough. No, it's not good enough. They should have known better. They should have wanted to honour God for his goodness to them. Instead, selfishness and laziness got the better. Does that ever feel familiar? 
The people bringing the dodgy offerings should have been pulled up on this, right? I mean, that's why they've got priests. I mean, they're there. They've got two aspects, sacrifices and teaching. And they're failing in both. They allowed the shoddy sacrifices to get brought and in doing so failed to faithfully teach God's word. This gets drawn out more in chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of armies. So I, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people because you are not keeping my ways but are showing partiality in your instruction. So priests are not doing a good job. They had turned away from God. They were teaching badly to the extent that people were stumbling. They were showing partiality in their instruction, which is basically, you know, I'm going to teach this group one thing and I'm going to teach this group another thing, but I'm not going to actually stick to what God's word says. These priests were failing big time and dragging God's people down with them. So no wonder God says, you despise my name. Their deeds and actions, the evidence, was showing no appreciation, no honour, no awe, no love for the God who loves them. So then how does God feel about this? And what does God say will be the consequences? What will God do to these people, in particular the priests, for the despising of his name, for their lack of proper worship? Let's have a look at chapter 1, verse 10. I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of armies, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Now that's extreme. Bernard mentioned last week this is a hard book, but to hear the creator of the universe say, I am not pleased with you. I mean, he was so upset with the priests that he wanted to have the temple closed up. So you've got to remember here, the temple was the place where God made himself present on earth, where he would dwell with his people. And he says, close the doors. Which is basically, I don't want to dwell with you anymore. You dishonour me so much with your half-hearted approach to worship that I don't want to be around you anymore. I mean, who could blame him, really? I mean, the temple and the sacrifices, these were gifts given by God out of his grace to a sinful people, a people that he loved. They were given so the people could have their sins forgiven and to express thanksgiving as part of the covenant established between God and his people. But that's not where their hearts were. Their hearts were in the, meh, near enough is good enough. Or the, look, I'm doing something for this God that I don't think loves me, so surely something's better than nothing, right? No. No, God loved them, and he laid out in his word how they were to worship. If they loved him and wanted to honour him, they would have been doing what was written. And then for the priests... I mean, this becomes a reality. In in chapter 2, have a read from verse 1. Therefore, this decree is for you, priests. If you don't listen and if you don't take it to heart to honour my name, says the Lord of armies, I will send a curse among you and I will curse your blessings. In fact, I have already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. So God had cursed the priests already. And you can see why. They were not taking it to heart. God had recognised and identified the key problem. It was their heart. Their heart was not in it. They were half-hearted in their worship of God. And for that, God had already cursed the priests. Let's look some more at verse 3. Look, I am going to rebuke your descendants and I will spread animal waste over your faces the waste from your festival sacrifices, and you will be taken away with it. So I'm really grateful that I got this passage to do in this series because I'm the one that gets to talk about poo, okay? 
So kids, listen up. This is, this is fun, this bit. God says to the priests and their descendants, essentially, he's going to wipe poo on their faces. Now, that's just gross to begin with, yeah? That's just something gross. But there's a really extreme significance to this symbol. The animal waste and the waste from the sacrifices was all the yucky bits cut out of the animal, including the poo tract, and these were not offered as on the burnt on the oh, oh, pfft, sorry, that was these were not offered or burnt on the altar as part of the sacrifice ritual. They would be taken outside the camp and disposed of because they were unclean, and if something's unclean, it can't be part. Of, You can't be in God's presence. So if you've got poo smeared on your face, well, then you're unclean too. Can you see the big problem here? The people, the priests, they dishonor God so much with their half-hearted, apathetic worship that they were going to be cut off from God's presence, sent outside the camp like waste, or like the previous image of the temple, God is going to close the doors of the temple and not let them in. God takes worship seriously, and he should. After all, he loved his people and made a covenant with them. He would be their God and they would be his people. God was fulfilling his end, and they were not. I'm at point five now. And this has all been pretty excruciating, yeah? Like, it's, <laughs> this is awful stuff, yeah? There doesn't seem to be a lot of hope for these people. But there is hope. God describes in chapter 2, verses 4 to 7, the ideal priest as he discusses the covenant with Levi. So I'm going to read through that passage, and as I do, I want you to think about someone who is to come who matches the criteria laid out here perfectly. Then you will know that I sent you this decree so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of armies. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave these to him. It called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and integrity and turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should desire instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. Ideally, this is how the priest would have been, revering God's name, giving true instruction, being blameless and walking in peace and integrity. But was that what was happening? No, because like us, the priests had one big problem, that sin. Sin was keeping them locked outside the doors. And it's the same for us, isn't it? Left to our own devices, we would continue to stand outside the door of God's house and never come in. Left to our own devices, God's name would never be renowned in our world. But the love of the Lord for his people is certain and relentless, and his name will be honoured. And this will only happen as the Lord himself opens the door and brings his people in. The Lord will judge sin, of the sin of his people, and through this, bring a priest who is everything the people's priests are not. And he did this. Now, if you want a really in-depth analysis of how he did this, read Hebrews, okay? Hebrews is great. But here's just one verse from Hebrews. Chapter 9, verse 11. Well, actually, I think it's two verses, but anyway. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus 
is the priest that God's people need. Jesus is the very sacrifice that they never brought. Jesus demonstrated his wholehearted devotion to his Father in his life, teaching his word faithfully, and in his death as the unblemished sacrifice. He always walked in fear, awe, and reverence of his Father, and he did this all the way to the cross, the one perfect sacrifice. I'm at the last point on the outline now. What does this mean for us then? Well, first, look to Jesus. Look at the love, the grace, and the mercy that's demonstrated in his sacrifice. Look to the one who fulfilled perfectly the role of the Levitical priest. Look to the one who opens the doors for us. Second one, as we seek to look to Jesus, do our priests point us to Jesus? Now, I'm not meaning the people that are going to cut up animals and stuff for us. No, I'm meaning those in the church who are appointed to lead and teach us. Are these people teaching God's word faithfully and pointing us to God's grace found in Jesus? Does their character match their practice? Do they exercise discipline? Or are they half-hearted in their job? Do they say one thing and do another? Do they have a near enough is good enough attitude? Now, I think that we've been really blessed at Narrabri Anglican for a really long time and in this diocese. However, we can't then get complacent. We've got to keep praying for our leaders, for those who preach, And for those, as Paul outlines in 1 Timothy, feed the sheep and shoot the wolves. We need to pray that they would continue to represent God truthfully from his word. Good leaders bring great blessing. But as we've seen today in Malachi, bad leaders can cause great pain, suffering and chaos. And third and finally, do we as the church and as individuals Value the sacrifices, Jesus, as we look to him as the perfect sacrifice. Do we honour him in our lives? Do we really love God above all else? Soon we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And the first two lines are, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When we say that, do we actually mean that? Or like the people in Malachi, do we dishonour the Father and despise his name. Now, we don't have to make regular sacrifices of sheep and cattle at the temple. No, Jesus has fulfilled all that for us. That's grace. But as Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, said, is our grace cheap grace, or is it costly grace? Do we take Jesus as our saviour, but then not as our Lord? Now, I think it can be easy to go, yeah, God's God's my father, Jesus is my saviour. But then find that actually living a life worshipping and serving God as a nuisance or something that gets in the way of how we think life should be. Thinking back to our series on the four Gs, are we wholehearted student followers of Christ? Now, I've been really challenged this these last few weeks by the image of the closed doors. You know, God wanted to close the doors of the temple on the people because of their half-hearted worship. Would God ever say the same of me? Because, I mean, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Through the saving work of Jesus, we now have God's Holy Spirit living in us as he lived in the temple. So do I honour him with my life? Do I show honour to him joyfully by making meeting with his people a priority every Sunday? Or do I let other things like social lives, sporting events, work, pleasure, or even just an attitude of, 
uh, it'll, just, it'll be right if I stay home, or no, I just wasn't feeling it today. Um, do I let that take the place, demonstrating half-hearted worship? Do I make sure I communicate excitedly and openly with God every day uh, through reading his word and through prayer? Or do I approach Bible reading as a chore, just something you do, you know, go through the motions? Or does it sit on my table and never open? Do I make personal sacrifices of time, effort or money for the benefit of his kingdom? Or are there other governors I would rather give my best to? Now, please don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying we have to do all these things to earn God's favour or to earn our salvation. Because God's already done that. That's grace. But do I live life knowing the joy of grace? Expressing that joy in the things I do and the things I say. So a little challenge for all of us as we leave today. Please don't leave thinking, yeah, I do give God the seconds. I don't honour him wholeheartedly. And then do nothing. Because that's just continuing to demonstrate a half-hearted attitude, isn't it? So let's get serious about honouring Jesus as our Saviour and our Lord. After all, He opened the doors for us. Let's pray. Lord God, our Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his life and death, for his wholehearted devotion to you. Thank you that he has made us right with you. Help us as your people to live lives that honour you, to not be half-hearted in our worship of you but to seek to bring you glory in everything we do. Amen.